Hi, you wonderful people. Yeah, great to see you. Well, it's uh, afternoon. Yeah, you're right. It's afternoon. Oh, we've got a little bit of banter going on here. That's good. I'm all in favour of a bit of banter. Anyway, have you had a good holiday uh, during the summer? Did you get any holiday during the summer? Some of you did, some of you didn't. Uh, I, listen, I, I hope you're rested, relaxed, and all the rest of it. I hope you had a good time. I heard that the beaches uh, were absolutely stacked full, and it was so difficult to get even a couple of feet of space to put sand in your sandwiches. I mean, I, I so. However, I just want to know that my my son found this one. That's a beach, huh? You obviously missed it. I'm sorry you didn't get there, but um, it's a great beach. You've got to travel a long way to get to this one. It's in France. It's down the bottom of France. So, uh, anyway. so listen, uh, back here at King's, um, forget all the beaches, I'm afraid. Um, I want to commend all those who've been serving during this time, during the summer. Um, You've just been great, and I know you've been stretched, I know it's been a bit of a pressure, and I don't know how you've done it at times, but serving teams such as Refreshments and Welcome and King's Kids, PA, Worship Bands, and and I could go on, but I don't want to take up all that time, but you've been marvellous, thank you so much. I also want to thank those who served at New Day. So, New Day is a young people's event. And we took 68 of our youngsters and a whole load of people went and served our youngsters there and they gave up a week of their holiday, their normal annual entitlement, just gave it up for the kids. I think that's fantastic. I think that deserves a round of applause. This is it. (coughs) Well, anyway, massive thanks to all you and the serving that you've done during the summer. Uh, among the many new people I've met, I met there, there were a couple of teachers who are starting this term, and I do hope they and anybody else who's been fairly new here, uh, I he- hope you feel really welcome here at King's. It's great, great to have you. Thank you for coming. I'm glad you're here today. This is the start of our sign-ups for small groups, as you've just heard. In your booklet, there is a comprehensive diary of events this term that you need to know. So I'm telling you, you need to know, and my wife's family are already on our diary. They, 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 they want to know, they want to know when the Christmas carol event is on. That's, that's their thing. They love it. They absolutely love it. It's just the other week. When do we book for the carol service? I mean, and don't ask me, by the way, I think it's in November sometime, but they, they want to be there. So, word of warning, we had nearly, by the way, we had nearly 1,500 people come to our carol service, four carol services last year, nearly 1,500 people, so it was brilliant. Um, I want, uh, so, those are the, these are the dates. The, we've had, to, had a couple of booking difficulties uh, through the Hazemere site, so one is on the 9th of December at the Hazemere site, and then down here at the town centre is on the 16th. So if you're into knowing your diary and where all these things are, that's the 9th and 16th of December. Today we call, as Richard said, Vision Sunday. In the 1990s, the United States presidential election voted Bill Clinton into the, into the White House. The perception was that George Bush, who was the incumbent president, uh, did not have a vision and Bill Clinton did. Vision. A similar encounter happened here in 1997 in the general election and Tony Blair defeated John Major, same reason. It appeared that John Major had run out of vision. Now, Vision Sunday is not to come up with new ideas all the time or anything like that. It's just to remind us who we are and what we're called to do. We need reminding of this because we forget And the Bible says, forget not all his benefits. And the Bible says, remember this, and remember that, and do this in remembrance. And so we need those moments where we remember things. So it's one of those. Vision shapes us as a church. It shapes us as a leadership. It shapes us in the way that we resource and equip the church. 
And with that in mind, in response to that, we will be praying for Ruth Wayman at the end of the meeting. This is Ruth, and she is here. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Now, Ruth's role has changed from PA and admin to a pastoral leader. Um, Her gifting in pastoring and getting alongside people has been evident, and we've just seen it grow over the years. And all we're doing is giving room for that that gift to really work through the church. So she's been excellent. In the UK in general, 61 to 65% of attendees are female. And that needs to be pastorally appreciated. And it needs to be pastorally represented. So her, her responsibilities actually will cover go across the church as a, in general. As she and her husband Rich are already involved with marriage support and her wisdom, we have to say, and her understanding of things have been for us as a leadership team absolutely invaluable. So we're going to be praying for Ruth at the end of the meeting. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 3, shall we? Verses 7 to 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is and shut and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word, not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth, or the whole world, to test the inhabitants of the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name, a new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, Church, this is a stack full of symbolism, and I, 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 I'm not going to do that justice this morning. We, we, you, you probably have to have at least two or three sessions on this, but it, it's stacked full. Um, and I'm simply going to go down two routes here. I want us to look at the character of this community, and I want to look at the mission of the community. That's what I want to do. So, if the letter, this the revelation is written, In 93 AD, that's about 60 years after Jesus died. And it's either just before or at the beginning of a major persecution. We also know know by this time, it's illegal to be a Christian. It's illegal to do what you are doing right at this very moment, sitting together, gathering together. It is illegal. You are not allowed to do this. That's the context. The emperor of the time had demanded that all subjects were required to take a pinch of incense and to throw it on the fire and say, Caesar Gideos. That's, they were all required to do that. Caesar is Lord. Now for most people in those cultures, there's no big deal. They had many gods. Whom they worship. So to throw another one in, even though it's Caesar, didn't make a lot of difference really. It's just another one in the pile. But for Christians it's a huge deal. Law abiding and respectful to the office of the emperor, yes. But to declare absolute allegiance to him, no. To honour the office of the emperor, yes. Render to Caesar what is Caesar. But to worship him, No, there's only one, only one Lord. Now they knew, the word of God says every knee will bow and every tongue confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not one of many, he is Lord. That's the context. Now, we just open this up a little bit more. The church of Philadelphia was one of seven churches to whom a word was given. You read that in Revelation 2 and 3, chapters 2 and 3. They were, these churches were located in Asia Minor, uh, which we now know as Turkey. And where, whatever you think about church, and as you read the goings on in some of these churches, you have to admit it's not flattering. To some of the churches. So, you've got lines like this. You, you've lost your first love. And to another church, you, you commit sexual immorality. To another one, you tolerate heresies. To another one, you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. It's not really diplomatic, is it really? Lukewarm. However, in, in chapter 1, you'll find that Jesus is standing amongst the lampstands. Now the lampstands represented the churches. Now what? He's not standing outside of the churches, looking in. He's not standing with one foot in. Perhaps I'll identify with them, or perhaps I won't. He's not doing that. He's standing amongst the churches, Hear this, please. If you don't hear anything else, Jesus loves the church. And you read all about these churches. Hey, he's standing right there in the middle. He gets church and he loves the church. Jesus loves the church. Messy? You better believe it. Absolutely. Come on, you know it's messy. You're here. I'm here. It's messy, isn't it? He loves the church. These words are given to the church. The gospel is received personally, but it's always for a people. You'll find, you'll find personal narratives and stories running all the way through the Bible. But the context is always, it's always family, tribe, nation, church. The gospel pulls us into community. It actually it changes our grammar. We instead of I. Our instead of my. Us instead of me. Jesus said, when you pray, say, what's he say? Our Father. It changes our grammar. The gospel is always an act of community, never an act of privacy. I didn't say not an act of pers- uh, that's personal. It is personal, of course. Private? No. It's always an act of community. A believing community is the context for a life of faith. This, this is written at a time when it's politically dangerous to do what we're doing. Gather together. I mean, it's just dangerous. God knows this community. Listen to his words. I know that you have little strength. Yet you've kept my word. And you've not and not have not denied my name. Do you know the formidable might of Rome is directed towards this church? And yet what strength they have, they have together. Not alone. Together. I mean it may be small, but I'll tell you this, with Jesus, it makes a difference. They need one another. My friends, nothing's changed. In our individualistic, privatized culture, nothing's changed. We need one another. We're going to talk about mission in a moment. But if we don't do this, you're out on your own. And I've seen enough casualties. essential if you've not had a revelation of it you you need it now you know God made this obvious obvious right from the very beginning so if you go to Genesis chapter 1 you read all about creation you some of you will have read it and it's got and and God created this and it was good and then God created this and, and it was good and then God created this and it was good and all the way through that first chapter you go and it was good it was good and then at the end he created Adam it's very good and then in chapter 3, 
you've got sin which ambushes mankind. So you would think if anything's not good, it's going to come there. But it doesn't. It comes in, the, in chapter 2. And God says, you know, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then in chapter 2, before sin comes in, he goes, it's not good. You come across that? It's, it's there, in chapter 2. It's not good. It says, it's not good for man to be alone. God has put an, a, an ache for community in every single one of us. He's put an ache for it. It's inbuilt. God has put it there. You know, I realize that Friends is having a resurgence, isn't it? The uh, TV series Friends, and a whole new generation are buying in. Younger generation are buying into Friends, and they love it. Why? It's all about community. God's put this ache in us. You know, at the end of the meeting, we'll have a small group guide in our hands, and I'm going to encourage you to get involved and Our faith in Christ grows in community. John Wesley said that the New Testament knows nothing about solitary religion. There are two things you cannot do. You cannot do alone. One is this. You can't marry alone. I know that's obvious, but but somebody's tried it. Somebody has tried it. This year I thought, oh my goodness me. And we have really gone places. I married myself. I don't understand that. Don't ask me, I don't understand it. You can't marry alone. Read my lips. You cannot marry alone. Listen, and you cannot do, you cannot be a Christian alone. You can't. It's not the way it's intended. Now recently I heard of somebody who had an operation, a part of a small group, and and. All that they're well involved in the church, and then they got meals, they got help, they have visiting. Why? Because our faith grows in community. Nobody came up to us in the office and said, Oh, would you do this, 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 this? Nobody did that. They were involved in community, just got on and did it. Small groups, that's how it works. Your faith grows in community, it grows in the church. Because I tell you what, it will get stretched. You go to a supermarket, you'll find that they have a shelf or two and it's earmarked damaged goods. Have you seen them? Damaged goods. And and, and with damaged goods, uh, you get some things that are dented, some things are torn, defaced. There's a flaw in everyone, everyone. You don't get any refunds. You can't bring about your damaged whatever. No refunds. No returns, you buy it as it is. That's the deal. That's people. They come as they are. Hopefully we don't stay as we are, but they come as they are. This is the church. It's like family in one sense. You don't get to choose your family. (laughs) Do you? Jesus chooses them here. Wow. Wow. He loves the church. The other week someone came up to me and they said during the worship time that God had given us such a special awareness of the joy of belonging here. And she wasn't expecting it. She'd been at the church longer than I have. And you must think, wow, that's a long time. And then she, but she was just caught by surprise at a sense of belonging here in, in this church among God's people. Jesus loves the church. You have little strength. But you know, together we make a difference. On occasions, new people have come to me and they've told me how good the church is. I tell you what, it's very flattering. I mean, I'm sorry if your experience is not that way. But uh, so it's very encouraging. And um, it, uh, to be honest, it's, it's, you know, if you're a pastor, you love hearing things like this. But every now and then I go, um, can you tell me, how long have you been coming? They say, well, I've been coming about three or four weeks. It's just wonderful it's just wonderful I said oh, you've not been here long enough it's not going to take long you see for somebody's going to step on your toes why because the constituents of the church is it's people it's people and God's at work I mean we all ought to have a label on us danger God at work you see. this is his family 
Most disappointments and pain in the church are because of failed expectations. I'm careful about my disappointments with others. The reason that I'm careful about my disappointment with others is because I'm pretty sure I've handed out a whole load of my own. I dump disappointment on other people. So I'm careful with that. I, and most of the disappointment that people have received at my hands, I suspect, I'm unaware of. Because God has put us amongst the gracious people. Careful with disappointments and your pain that you make too personal. Careful. This church may have a little strength here, but it's not gone unnoticed. I only encourage you, my friends. Get in. We're not a small group. This is no advertising campaign. This is your birthright. Get in. Get involved. Let's have a look at this video, shall we? Just a couple of minutes of it. When I joined the Tom Renza UK, it was really a culture shock for me in many ways. I was at home alone with our daughter and a newborn baby. I didn't know anyone and couldn't speak English. It was a very dark and lonely time, even worse than being persecuted in Ethiopia. Then I was invited to go to Fantots, the mothers and toddlers group at King's. It was amazing how I was accepted and loved and looked after. I met Diane and Norman, and their family became like our family. They would listen to what I was going through. They would take me to the shops and take us out for meals. It was the blessing of God to us that he brought this family into our life and leads us to things. I knew Kings was the right place from the start. It was like the United Nations led by Christ. It was wonderful to see black and white joined in harmony and love. There is an Ethiopian church in London, but we didn't want to go there because God called us here. He called us to High Wycombe and he called us to Kings where we could worship with different people and a mix of cultures. Even though there are many cultural differences, we felt like God had led us home. So I, I, I want to encourage you to get involved. You know, this church, uh, this church here, knows about stickability. There'll be some of you who've been coming decades, and there'll be some of you who've been coming weeks. And there may be a few of you who come just today. If you've been here decades, sometimes you get a bit numb to church. I'm used to this. I've done it before. Here we go today. Quite, we get a little bit used to it. Guys, let me just say quite nicely to you, stop it and get involved. Don't sit on the outside. Don't sit on the outside. Don't do that. Get involved. It's really key for you. Be part of others. Richard Lacey writes an article called Am I a Consumer Christian? And I'm, I'm just going to give you one, actually, because there's so many. He's a, he, he's a, he goes on sabbatical. He's a lead pastor, and uh, he visits these churches. He goes to visit these churches, and he begins to recognize something going on in him. And at the end of it, he writes this paper called, Am I a Consumer Christian? You can download it, I suspect, on the internet. It's worth a read. But I'll, I will just give you this one here. Uh, when I approach church as a consumer, I come as an individual Interacting with others is an inconvenient necessity. I therefore don't hang around long after meetings. Or if I do, I only speak with a small circle of friends. I'm uncomfortable with small groups. Because they involve participation, scrutiny, close personal contact. When I approach church in a Christ-like way... I become part of a community 
And while at times it was, it's challenging, I count it a privilege to be part of a fellowship of diverse people with whom I can share my life. I welcome the accountability and scrutiny that comes from close contact with members of a small group. And I seek to be an active participant in one, praying for and pastoring others. Am I a consumer Christian? I can't help it, I'm going to say it. This one. Uh, when I approach church as a consumer, I come to be served. I expect others to meet my needs. I expect the service or activities or pastor to tick all my boxes. If not, I may decide to complain to the management or to fellow consumers. When I approach church in a Christ-like way, I come to serve. I realize God has given me gifts to build others up, and I consider it a privilege to use them. My focus is on blessing others by fulfilling the role he has given me within the body of Christ. Good question. Am I a consumer Christian? So it's very interesting. We live in a heavily private and individualistic culture. Hebrews 10 says this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good works. You can't do that unless you're with one another. You just can't. You can attend. And you can attend on a Sunday and then go. And, but unless you're with one another, you can't do that. If you're not connected in, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. So sometimes in our culture, we have a culture that comes to church, what, once every two weeks, once every three weeks, once every four weeks. I go to church, but it's, you know, uh, what we do infrequently becomes a habit. And we need to get on board, you know. I'm saying all this because as a church we have a mission here. We can't do it like that. We have to do it as church. The gates of hell will not prevail against God's people. He's called us to this town. You may have got a cheaper house or you may have been called for a job or whatever and all that's valid, I understand that. But we've been called to a mission here. And we want to see the kingdom of God break in here. Do I get an amen? amen. We well, need an amen on this. See, he says, verse 8, see. That means look, I place before you an open door. An open door look, that no one can shut. And it's doors of opportunity, churching, it's doors of opportunity for the gospel. You know, he, he says to the church in, in Colossae, he says, Pray that the God that God may open a door for our message, open a door, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. It's an opportunity to to give the gospel away. My friends, we've been blessed to be a blessing. This church here experienced many closed doors. Many of the believers were from a Jewish background. The synagogue had closed its doors, and therefore family had closed the doors and friendships had closed the doors and the people they did their livelihood and got their money from closed the doors they knew what closed doors were they got closed doors some people here you will have experienced some of that with family or friends or through work well we have an open door here and we've been called to bring the very life and be the very life of God in this place So on our series that we're doing in the autumn, we're doing it through our small groups. It's called Bless, till the B is begin with prayer. And L is listen, and E is eat. S is serve, and the S's, other S's, share your story. It's best if it goes in that, uh, along that line. Don't put the S before the B. You know, get into prayer stuff. Pray for people. Point of being blessed is to be a blessing. That's the point of it. And we've been doing this as a staff being, uh, for the last year. We've uh, had a list of people that we've all been praying for. Uh, each one's had their own list. What has surprised me, I feel embarrassed to say that, what has surprised me is the number of opportunities that we've had as the time has gone on. It's been, it, you know, it is not a coincidence as we started to pray. It's a God incident. 
Yeah, we prayed and then we would feed back to each other on a Tuesday morning and then we would hear. I had some conversations this year I have never had before. Unbelievable. So uh, get on board. You know, pro- families, friends, those you work with. It's very, very helpful. We're in Wickham for Wickham. We're up at Hazelmere for Hazelmere. That's why we're here. It's to reach the unchurched, to reach those who've never been to church, to those who are never going to church. And we are here to love and serve this town, not just to be our own thing. You know, the reason we went to Hazelmere was because it's a community and we wanted to be amongst the community. So last September, oh by the way, if, you, if you're thinking, well, where, can, can I, where could I connect in? I, my number of friendships that I have are limited and I've got plenty of time on my hands but I, I don't know any people like I used to. We have Little Stars here, which is a mother and toddlers group and it goes on a Tuesday and a Friday and you want opportunities to get to know people. It's on your doorstep. Tuesdays, Friday mornings, I mean, and it's just a really good opportunity. You know, you could serve here to start with, and in the serving, you get to know people. You want somebody on your list? Who am I going to pray for? I'll have one of those. It's a great opportunity. Last September, Catherine Lodge started a prayer group. They're praying for vulnerable women in this town. This is a known problem. There are hot spots in the centre of High Wycom near this town centre site where women are being sexually exploited. It's known. And recently the prayer group have been around on prayer walks around the area. The police know all about it. They've been advised and uh, they, they are extremely supportive and very positive about what is happening and our, our response to seeing such a need my friends, this is an open door. We're at the moment in talks with a, a charity called Azalea. They have considerable experience in this matter. And uh, with regard to possibly being a, a franchise of this charity, they're based in Luton. They have a wealth of understanding in this culture. It's an open door. We're in Wickham for Wickham. Well, that's why we're here. So... In your small group guide, you'll find, you'll find a, notion, a mention of King's Table. And this is still being worked out. But the heart behind this, as a few people have noticed, is that it's to reach out to those with addictions. Mostly are dr- drug and um, alcohol addictions. And sporadically we've had what people, people come here, but they've never been able to hinge in. King's Table is simply to provide a meal. I don't know the timetable of these things, but we're still working on it. It's to provide a meal. It's part of the fundamental needs of a person. It's food. People whose lives have been wrecked. You know, it's easier to reach out when you have something to show for reaching out. A meal. Again, as we saw advice from other places, such as Catford, King's Church Catford and Wickham Homeless Connection, they've been really helpful in this. Max Licardo, he writes, he's a Christian author, and um, he tells of a time his dad took him and a friend fishing, except the rain and the snow meant they were cooped up in a camper truck for a week, which ended up with bickering and griping. He writes, I learned a lesson that week, not about fishing, but about people. When those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. (laughs) When energy intended to be used outside is used inside, the result is explosive. Instead of casting nets, we cast stones. Instead of extending helping hands, we point accusing fingers. Instead of being fishers of the lost, we become critics of the saved. Rather than helping the hurting... We hurt the helpers. Great little line, isn't it? When those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. He says, the next time the challenges outside tempt you to shut the door, stay inside and stay inside. Stay long enough to get warm 
and then get out. When those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. We're not called to be inverted on one another. We're called to mission. Sometimes we argue more when we've got something significant to argue about. I wonder if we're going to have an argument, let's have something worth arguing about. Don't come and bring all your arguments to me after the meeting, by the way, please. It's an open door. Jesus came. Now, whoever would believe on him would know the forgiveness of God, would have a new life, and it would be an everlasting life, an eternal life. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying. And he knows what's coming. And he can see the pain and the suffering coming. And, and the judgment of God is going to come on him instead of you and me. And he goes to his father. Three times he prays, if you're willing, if it's possible, take this cup from me. And every time, the door is closed. Every time the door is closed. Jesus, Jesus knows all about closed doors. And doors closed and he experienced the pain and the suffering for you and me. What for? That we might have an open door. And that we could walk into the open door of the gospel and know Jesus Christ. That's an amen. That is such an amen, my friends. So let's not miss the ordinary. Let's not miss the adventure of being in Christ. It's right on our doorstep. Let's just batter down. Let's batter down the gates of hell. And let's bring the kingdom of God into this town. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.